everyone, I am Dr. Zulekha Malik and if you want to know more about me, you can visit my profile at skydia.com. So today we are going to discuss a very important topic. It is pituitary gland and its relation to the hypothalamus. Now we are going to study about how pituitary gland is the master gland of the body and the glands and the hormones that it produces. We are going to discuss the relation between the hypothalamus and the pituitary gland, the functions of the most important uh, hormone produced by the pituitary gland, which is a growth hormone. And then we are going to discuss the abnormalities which are related with the growth hormone. So let us begin. Now let us have an introduction to the pituitary gland, which is also known as the master gland of the body. Its second name would be hypophysis. It is an endocrine gland about the size of the pea, weighing only 0.5 grams. So in this diagram, you can see this is the pituitary gland. This is the hypothalamus. Now hypothalamus is the control center of the brain and it is um, located below the thalamus and it ends in the pituitary gland. So it rests upon the hypophysial fossa of the sphenoid bone in the center of the middle cranial fossa. Now this is the exact um, location of the pituitary gland which is going to tell you where it is located in the brain. So in the, in the middle cranial fossa there is a bony cavity, there is a bony depression known as uh, the cella tertica. It is uh, specially made for the uh, pituitary gland to uh, be present here like in this diagram you can see this is the hypophysial fossa and this uh, there is a depression of the bone called as cella tertica and it the roof is formed by a flat layer of dura mater which is uh, known as a diaphragm cilia so here you can see so it is it rests upon the hypophysial fossa of the sphenoid bone in the center of the middle cranial fossa which is surrounded by a small bony cavity and covered by a dural fold diaphragm cilia. So this is hypothalamus, this is the pituitary gland uh, and it is just the size of a pea, very small in size. This is the exact location as discussed. So here you are. So what are the parts of the pituitary gland? gland? It, is a, uh, it is known as a master gland of the body because it produces a set of very important hormones uh, of the body uh, which are crucial in the development and the growth of the human body. So there, it is, uh, there are three parts of the pituitary gland. The first part is the anterior pituitary or also adenohypophysis. It is a lobe that regulates several physiological processes, including st stress, growth, reproduction, and lactation. So these are the, the few functions performed by the hormones which are produced by, uh, specifically by this lobe of the pituitary. Now then comes the intermediate lobe, which is present bet between the anterior and the posterior pituitary. The intermediate lobe synthesizes and secretes melanocyte stimulating hormone, which is also known as MSH. In humans, the intermediate lobe is uh, considered as rudimentary, uh, but it does produce melanocyte stimulating hormone. Now, MSH has three types, it could be alpha, beta, or gamma. The alpha MSH produces melanin in human bodies in the skin, and it also, um, uh, in, in pregnancy, the secretion of melanin increases. That is uh, one of the function of MSH. It also suppresses appetite, uh, and uh, when it is, um, present in hypothalamus. So this, these are a few functions of MSH. Now the posterior pituitary, which is also very important, it is also known as neurohypophysis. It is functionally connected to the hypothalamus by the pituitary stalk. So this is a connection between the hypophysis and hypothalamus, the pituitary stalk, also known as the infundibulum. The hormones produced by the posterior pituitary, they regulate um, water, uh, absorption in the body and uh, the hormones are named as oxytocin and vasopressin which are we are going to discuss these hormones in detail in the coming slides in this diagram it's very easy, easy to see this is the anterior pituitary gland the anterior pituitary lobe of the gland 
This is the posterior pituitary because it is located posteriorly to the anterior lobe. And this is the intermediate lobe, which is a, just a remnant in adult humans. This is the stalk that connects the median eminence. Median eminence is the lowermost part of the hypothalamus. It, is, uh, it forms the inferior boundary of the hypothalamus and it is uh, situated on top of the pituitary stalk. As you can see here, this is a median eminence, this is a stalk, this is the posterior part, posterior lobe, this is the anterior lobe. As mentioned earlier, this is a cellar tertica, the bony cavity, this is a sphenoid bone, and this is the flat fold of dura mater, which forms the roof of the cellar tertica. This. So now we have studied about the location of the pituitary gland and also the anatomy. So now let us discuss the various cell types which are present in this gland. There are certain cell types which are in turn going to produce different hormones in this gland. So namely the corticotrophs are the cells which produce uh, adenocortic uh, corticotrophic hormones and somatotrophs produce growth hormone and lactotrophs these produce prolactin and these mammosomatotrophs are going to produce growth hormone and prolactin both thyrotrophs are involved in the production of thyroid stimulating hormone and gonadotrophs are going to produce fsh and lh which uh, which which are named as uh, follicle stimulating hormone and luteinizing hormone so these are the names of the hormones and these are the cell types which uh, these hormones are made of these cells are going to produce these hormones now these are the cell types in anterior pituitary lobe what are the cells present in the posterior pituitary lobe now the posterior pituitary hormones they are actually um, produced by hypothalamus there are certain nuclei in the hypothalamus which synthesize these hormones which are then transferred or transported to the um, posterior lobe of the pituitary so these neurons which are present uh, in the hypothalamus are known as magnocellular neurons which are located precisely in the supraoptic and paraventricular paraventricular nuclei of the hypothalamus these are the names of the nuclei of the hypothalamus that are going to produce the hormones of the posterior pituitary so here you can see the hormones produced by the pituitary TSH is going to act on the thyroid gland ACTH is going to act on the adrenal cortex and going to produce uh, uh, cortisol which is a glucocorticoid which is a steroid hormone FSH and LH follicle stimulating hormone and luteinizing hormone it is going to act on ovaries or testes growth hormone acts on the entire body and prolactin is going to act on the mammary glands. So all these hormones are very important uh, hormones of the anterior pituitary gland. Now what are, we are just going to have an overview of these hormones and I'm going to discuss growth hormone in particular uh, in details. So we know that thyroid stimulating hormone produces uh, or stimulates the thyroid hormone to produce um, the thyroid hormone. The ACTH is going to have an effect on adrenal cortex to produce cortisol. Now cortisol, what does it do? It stimulates immunity and it uh, enhances the metabolism of fats and glucose. So it, it is a very important uh, hormone. The FSH is a follicle, a follic, follicle stimulating hormone. It is going to uh, have a stimulatory effect in on in the follicles of the ovaries to produce follicles and then in, it also helps in the release of the egg the luteinizing hormone acts uh, on the ovaries as well it works uh, synergistically with the fsh and the lh surge triggers ovulation and also helps in the development of corpus luteum which then prepares the body for the implantation stage in males the luteinizing hormone is going to produce testosterone So these are a few functions of FSH and LH. The growth hormone works on the entire body we are going to discuss um, 
this in detail. The prolactin, the prolactin works on the mammary glands and produce helps in the production of milk. And that is the these are the few functions of the anterior pituitary gland. So now what is the relation of the pituitary and the, uh, to the hypothalamus? Now hypothalamus is that center of the brain, that part that controls the pituitary secretion. Now hypothalamus is uh, located below the thalamus um, and it is uh, called as the control center of the brain. It controls many uh, functions of the body. It controls uh, temperature and appetite and hunger and many other such functions. It, it performs a dual role uh, as an endocrine gland and as a nervous system uh, as well. So what does it, uh, what effect does it have on the pituitary? The posterior pituitary secretion is totally controlled by the nerve signals which are originating in the hypothalamus. The posterior pituitary secretion is um, the posterior pituitary lobe is not glandular in function. It actually contains nerve fibers or axons, which are the endings of the nerves, which uh, carry the uh, secretions which are produced by the certain nuclei of hypothalamus. Now, anterior pituitary secretion is also con controlled by the hypothalamus. The hypothalamus releases some inhibitory and releasing hormones, which actually will either enhance the production of the pituitary lobe or it is going to inhibit the production. So these hormones which are either inhibitory in function or releasing ones, they are conducted to the anterior pituitary through a, a portal a system, through a minute blood vessel system known as a hypothalamic hypophysial portal system. So we are going to discuss this in detail in the coming slides. So what is a hypothalamic hypophysial portal? It is actually a portal that connects the anterior uh, pituitary to the hypothalamus. It is a link between these two parts, between the hypothalamus and the anterior pituitary. Now this, what this link does it, does is that it provides those hormones that are inhibiting or releasing. Uh, it transports these to the anterior pituitary. Now the lower portion of hypothalamus, which as already discussed, is known as a median eminence, which uh, re which regulates the uh, hormones, and it uh, part it is it forms the inferior boundary of the hypothalamus. That median eminence connects inferiorly with the pituitary stalk. So that lower portion of hypothalamus connects inferiorly with the pituitary stalk. The small penetrating and returning arteries they form collectively these hypothalamic hypophysial blood vessels. The vessels then pass downward along the pituitary stalk to supply blood to the anterior pituitary sinuses. So it is a blood supply system as well and these vessels pass downward through this stalk. So this pituitary stalk is actually a relay or it is a connection between the hypothalamus and the hypophysial systems. You can see in this diagram, the hypophysial portal system. This is the median eminence. This is the hypothalamus. This is the pituitary stalk. This is the anterior lobe. This is the posterior lobe. The hormones of the posterior pituitary, namely as oxytocin and antidiuretic hormone, they are transferred from the neurosecretory cells in the median eminence or hypothalamus. They are going to be produced here and then transported here through the stalk. This is the capillary bed and you can see this, this is the hypophysial portal system. Now the hypothalamic releasing and inhibitory hormones, they are secreted into the median eminence. Now what is, what is the function of these releasing and inhibitory hormones? There are special neurons secrete, uh, these special neurons, they secrete and synthesize the releasing and inhibitory hormones. Nerve fiber endings are uh, going to secrete these hormones into the tissue fluids and then they are immediately absorbed into this portal system and carried to the sinuses of the anterior pituitary. So the special neurons are going to secrete and uh, synthesize the hormones then the endings are going to uh, secrete these hormones into the fluids which, which is then absorbed by the 
hypophyseal portal system and then carry to the sinuses of the anterior pituitary. So this is the method by which the releasing and inhibitory hormones they are transported from the hypothalamus to the anterior pituitary. Now what are the names of these releasing hormones and inhibitory hormones of the hypothalamus? Now the prolactin inhibiting hormone, this is one of the hormone which is an inhibiting hormone and it is going to inhibit the release of prolactin. There is a thyrotropin releasing hormone TRH, it is going to stimulate the secretion of TSH and prolactin. So this is a three sequence hormone system, first the hypothalamus uh, hypothalamus is the first part it is going to release hormones which control the secretion of the um, hormones produced by the pituitary which in turn then uh, uh, stimulates or inhibits the, or uh, uh, affects the production of the hormones produced by the target glands. Now the CRH is a corticotropin releasing hormone it is going to stimulate the secretion of ACTH adrenocorticotropic hormones the growth hormone releasing hormone is going to stimulate the secretion of growth hormone by the anterior pituitary and then again we also have an inhibiting hormone for the growth hormone which is known as a somatostatin it is going to inhibit the release of growth hormone prolactin and TSH all these three then lastly we have gonadotropin releasing hormone this this hormone is going to stimulate the secretion of luteinizing hormone and FSH follicle stimulating hormone. So these are the few names, these are the names of the inhibiting and releasing hormones of the hypothalamus which are going to influence the secretion of the anterior pituitary. Now we are going to discuss the growth hormone in detail. Now growth hormone does not affect a target gland. It is not uh, a part of a three sequence system. It is actually just a two sequence system. It's releasing hormone and inhibiting hormone centers or it is, the releasing and inhibiting hormones are produced by the hypothalamus and then it is directly uh, secreted by the pituitary gland. It does not have a target gland. It's, uh, it has a vast majority of effects. It has a broad uh, range of uh, influence and it, its effects are directed on all the tissues of the body. Its action on protein metabolism is that it increases the amino acid entry in cells. It um, increases protein synthesis, uh, increases DNA transcription to mRNA, which is going to then uh, produce more genes and uh, which in turn is going to um, make more proteins and make more proteins in the cells. So it decreases protein catabolism or breakdown by mobilizing free fatty acids. It decreases gluconeogenesis. Gluconeogenesis is the production of um, uh, glucose by other substances other than uh, uh, um, glycogen. So that is. Uh, the growth hormone is going to decrease this process it is going to cause a positive uh, sodium balance as well so this is the effect of growth hormone on protein metabolism it is going to mobilize free fatty acids from adipose tissue the breakdown of adipose tissue is going to result in free fatty acids in um, body fluids and then the conversion of fatty acids into acetyl-CoA to be utilized for the energy. So this is going to provide extra energy for, to the body from the fatty acids which come from the adipose tissue. So it is basically increasing the protein synthesis, it is mobilizing the fat, fatty acids and mobilizing the uh, adipose tissues and it is going to decrease the utilization of glucose by glycolysis. So this is its uh, function on carbohydrate uh, effect on carbohydrate metabolism. It has an it is ha has an hyperglycemic effect. It is going to increase glycogen deposition because it is going to decrease uh, the breakdown of glycogen and utilization of glucose by glycolysis. So it is going to decrease glucose entry in cells. 
it actually um, has a very positive effect on cartilage and bone growth hormone acts on the liver and uh, signals the liver to produce uh, proteins which are known as somatomedines and these act on the cartilage and bone to stimulate their growth on soft tissues it is going to uh, deposit it is going to increase the deposition of connective tissue it is going to cause thickening of the skin it is going to cause growth of certain organs such as thymus kidney and liver it is going to increase milk secretion due to prolactin like action and generally it is going to increase the number of cells it is going to increase uh, the number of cell size so that is the general um, accumulative function of the growth, growth hormone that to actually increase the cell size to increase the cell numbers so it, when we talk about the abnormalities of growth hormone all these effects come into uh, action if growth hormone is deficient all these parts uh, or systems are going to be affected and if growth hormone is in excess all these uh, effects of growth hormone come into uh, view which are which could be very harmful as well we are going to discuss the abnormalities of growth hormone in the end now what are somatomedines somatomedines are the proteins which are produced by the liver and uh, the stimulus is the growth hormone the growth hormone is going to cause or stimulate the liver to form these proteins and then they have a very potent effect of increasing all aspects of bone growth now because it uh, actually activate a lot of insulin receptors and has then insulin like effect as well so it is also known as the insulin like growth factor it is uh, basically going to increase protein synthesis it is it also has a positive effect on osteocytes and bone growth bone development so th this is a function of somatomedines adequate insulin activity and availability of carbs are necessary for growth hormone to be effective these two factors are very important for growth hormone to function properly so if the person is deficient in uh, carbs or insulin the growth hormone effects are not going to be as efficient now these are certain factors that stimulate or inhibit the secretion of growth hormone now the decreased blood glucose is going to enhance the growth hormone secretion because the growth hormone has a hyperglycemic effect so if the blood glucose levels are low it is going to stimulate the production of growth hormone decreased blood fatty acids starvation or decreased protein in the diet or protein deficiency so in all these factors the most important is protein deficiency it uh, actually stimulates growth growth hormone the most so these factors are going to inhibit the growth hormone secretion increased blood glucose increased free fatty acids aging obesity growth hormone inhibitory hormone all these are inhibitors of the growth hormone secretion so so in this uh, graph you can see this is a plasma growth hormone and its uh, value is the highest in protein deficiency so if the person this is a effect of extreme protein deficiency uh, in a disease called kosher which is uh, a protein deficiency now you can see the uh, the concentration of the growth hormone is the highest in protein deficiency now if you give carbohydrate treatment for 3 days if you enhance or if you increase carbs in the diet the growth hormone uh, concentration remains the same it has no effect on the growth hormone but if you are going to have protein treatment you are going to increase proteins in the diet growth hormone concentration comes down so if for a few days uh, let's say 25 days protein treatment is going to cause decrease in plasma growth hormone levels so this shows how important proteins are uh, in the regulation of growth hormone the protein deficiency is a very important factor in increasing or decreasing the plasma growth hormone now what are the hypothalamic nuclei that control the releasing hormone 
and inhibiting hormone from the hypothalamus. Now, as we have already discussed, that hypothalamus releases growth hormone releasing hormone and somatostatin, which is a growth hormone inhibiting hormone. Now, the part of the hypothalamus that is responsible for the releasing hormone is the ventromedial nucleus. In this diagram, you can see this is the ventromedial nucleus. This part here is the ventromedial nucleus and it is responsible for the production of growth hormone releasing hormone. And the somatostatin, it is controlled by other nearby areas of the hypothalamus. Other nearby areas which are not uh, clear, um, these are in control of the secretion of inhibiting hormone. Now growth hormone releasing hormone, it binds to the growth hormone releasing hormone receptors which then result in increased growth hormone production mainly by the CMP camp dependent pathway. The CMP is a, a pathway which produces energy when ATP is converted into CAMP which then initiate protein uh, stimulates protein kinase uh, which causes phosphorylation and then uh, the, a cascade of events occur and also by the phospholipase C pathway. What is the phospholipase C pathway is that uh, there, this uh, enzyme, phospholipase, it is going to cause a breakdown of the phospholipid into further second messenger systems that are going to enhance uh, and carry out further uh, uh, pathways, further events that are going to uh, cause the target cells to produce a hormone response by the growth hormone. So the two pathways are the CMP pathway and the phospholipase second messenger pathway. So far we have discussed the importance of pituitary gland and its, uh, its secretions or the hormones which are produced by its uh, posterior and anterior lobes. We have discussed the relation between the pituitary gland and hypothalamus. This is a control center and this is a master gland. How they both coordinate to perform various functions. We discussed that. We discuss the physiological functions of the gro growth hormone. Now, now we are going to discuss the abnormalities of growth hormone. Okay, so this is a feedback control. Uh, let us have a look on this. The hypothalamus is going to stimulate this positive sign here predicts the stimulation. It shows that the hypothalamus is going to have is going to release growth hormone releasing hormone which has a positive feedback or positive response towards the anterior pituitary. So the anterior pituitary in, in response to the releasing hormone going to produce the growth hormone. The growth hormone inhibiting hormone which is also known as a somatostatin is going to have a negative effect on anterior pituitary. It is going to inhibit the production of growth hormone. Here we can see the negative sign. So now the growth hormone, if when produced by the anterior pituitary, is going to stimulate the liver to produce IGF, which is insulin-like growth factor, somatomedines. High levels of IGF is going to stimulate the inhibiting hormone. Now again, this IGF is going to have a positive effect on the inhibiting hormone. So this is a negative feedback here. And high levels of growth hormone are also going to have a negative effect on the releasing hormone here the high levels of growth hormone are going to have a negative effect on the growth hormone releasing hormone so this table shows the factors that have a positive or a negative effect on the production of growth hormone now we are going to discuss a few abnormalities of the growth hormone what happens when this growth hormone which is which controls uh, all the tissues growth and development what happens if the uh, if this hormone is in excess of the required amount or it is uh, in decreased amounts as compared to what it is what is needed so the abnormalities of growth hormone are very important the number one uh, here is the pan hypopituitarism it is decreased secretion of all the anterior pituitary hormones so there is a generalized deficiency of the anterior pituitary hormones. It could be congenital, it could appear in any time in life and 
the main reason behind that is a pituitary tumor. Now what is dwarfism? Now if the, the height or the stature of the human body is very short due to the generalized deficiency of the anterior pituitary hormones during childhood, then it is going to result in dwarfism. There is a decreased rate of development and it can be completely cured if it is treated early in life. So the adult panhypopituitarism, which is a generalized deficiency of uh, the hormones, if it, if it happens in adult life, it is going to cause hypothyroidism because of, the, uh, because of so many hormones that are influenced by anterior pituitary. This uh, deficiency is going to have effects on all of those. So there's going to be hypothyroidism, depressed production of glucocorticoids, and most probably cortisol, Hypothyroidism uh, occurs because of the decreased quantities of TSH, the suppressed secretion of gonadotropic hormones as well. So what is gigantism? Now, if large amounts of growth hormone is produced due to any reason, it could be tumors, it could be increased activation. So if large amounts appear before adolescence, which means that before the long epiphyses of the long bones have become fused with the shafts, then height increases. There's no stopping of the height increase then. Height increases so that the person becomes a giant. So the most important factor here is that this um, increased secretion of growth hormone is occurring before the long bones have become fused with the shafts. So they increase in size and there's no stopping of that and the person becomes a giant. What happens is uh, because of the hyperglycemic effect of the growth hormone, as we have already discussed that it has, uh, it decreases, um, uh, it actually decreases the um, usage of glucose it uh, decreases the entry of glucose in the cells and increases the glucose levels in the blood so it has a hyperglycemic effect it is going to eventually cause diabe diabetes mellitus and generalized deficiency will occur if it's a tumor then it is eventually going to destroy the uh, growth uh, the anterior pituitary gland and then it is going to result in death so that was gigantism now, if this tumor occurs after the adolescence, which means that the height uh, will not increase because the epiphyses of the long bones have already been fused with the shaft. So the height is not going to increase, but other factors come into point. The height is not going to uh, increase because the person cannot grow taller because of the bone effect. The bones have already been fused with the shaft, so the person is not going to grow taller, but the bones are going to be thick and the membranous bones such as uh, those of nose, forehead, lower jaw, this is going to enlarge, these bones are going to enlarge. Now because the lower jaw uh, growth continues uh, up till uh, later in life, so some people have a very marked growth of the lower jaw. It is um, sometimes ahead of the upper jaw and the enlargement of soft tissue organs as well. The such as a tongue, liver and kidney. So this is a diagram of a person suffering from acromegaly. You can see the thick bones and soft tissues are thick, flat nose, the forehead, there are uh, forehead and the nose are enlarged and the lower jaw is uh, bigger and larger than normal. Now decreased growth hormone secretion also causes uh, changes associated with aging as well. So this is another abnormality of the growth hormone. So that was uh, the growth hormone uh, which, was, which is secreted by the anterior pituitary gland. Now we are going to discuss the posterior pituitary gland and its relation to the hypothalamus. Now posterior pituitary gland or the posterior pituitary lobe is um, pres present posterior to the anterior lobe as we have already uh, discussed earlier. The neuronal projections of magnocellular cells, they extend from the uh, certain nuclei of the hypothalamus 
and then they are transported to the posterior pituitary. Now this is a neurosecretory cell. You can see uh, it could be uh, here you can in the median eminence or in the hypothalamus the supraoptic and paraventricle nuclei of the hypothalamus they are going to secrete the neurohormones oxytocin and ADH. Now the cell bodies of these nuclei they secrete the hormones which through the carrier proteins which are known as neurophysins they are because uh, through these carrier proteins these hormones are transported down to the nerve endings in the posterior pituitary gland. So posterior lobe is not glandular in function. These hormones are actually produced in the hypothalamus. There are certain special cells which are uh, known as pituocytes, which are specialized glial cells and they're present in the posterior lobe. Now the glial cells are, um, uh, they protect the neurons, they insulate the neurons and the, these specialized, the ones which are present in the posterior pituitary are known as pituocytes. They are um, helpful in the storage and release of these neurohormones which are produced by the hypothalamus. Now the first hormone that we are going to discuss which is uh, produced by the hypothalamic nuclei is the oxytocin. Now the major function of oxytocin is the stimulation of uterine muscles. It causes a contraction of those muscles and uh, it helps in the start of the labor. Now it also increases production of prostaglandins which moves the uh, labor along further. So the uh, uterine distension is a stimulus, it is going to enhance production of oxytocin, contractions occur, labor begins, then there is production of prostaglandins as well which has a synergistic effect on the labor pains, labor contractions. It also stimulates the milk ejection by the contraction of myoepithelial cells in the mammary glands. Now when these myoepithelial contract, these myoepithelial cells contract, it stimulates milk ejection. So this is another very important function of oxytocin. And the stimulus for this milk ejection is the suckling stimulus. Here for the uterine muscle contraction, the stimulus was a uterine distension. And here is this, the suckling is a stimulus for milk ejection. And in men or in males, it, it uh, actually enhances sperm motility and is involved in the production of testosterone. So these are a few functions of oxytocin hormone. Now what are the functions of the other very important hormone which is the antidiuretic hormone or also known as vasopressin. Now what vasopressin does is that it increases an antidiuresis. Now antidiuresis means that it uh, decreases, uh, the, uh, decreases the excretion of uh, a lot of water from the urine. It is going to increase water permeability of the distal convoluted tubule and collecting duct cells in kidney. These are the part of these are the parts of kidney which are involved in the absorption of water. So they increase the water permeability of these parts and they in turn absorb a lot of water. So uh, there is um, a very little water left for the excretion. Uh, in the form of urine. So they allow water reabsorption and excretion of more concentrated urine which is known as, this whole process is known as antidiuresis. Basically they help, this ADH helps in the reabsorption of water and helps in water retention. Now at high concentrations it also raises blood pressure by inducing vasoconstriction. So this is another very important function of uh, ADH, but this occurs in very high concentrations of the hormone. So now in uh, this diagram, you can see the water absorption across the collecting tubule cell. Now this is the cell and these, this is the lumen of the collecting tubule and this, this is the bloodstream. So the water is absorbed from the lumen to the bloodstream through aquaporins. Aquaporins are water channels 
They are integral membrane proteins and they serve as channels and help in the transfer of water. So aquaporins are going to allow more water to run across them and reach the bloodstream. So when more water is absorbed, less water is left for excretion in the urine. So the aquaporin pores are inserted into the cell membrane, increasing the flow of water out of the tubule. So in summary, this is the blood stream. This is the lumen of the collecting tubule. So what ADH does is that it increases the water permeability of this lum uh, collecting tubule membrane or the cells. This permeability is increased by ADH. Also, uh, it is uh, just to be um, another definition of vasopressin. Vasopressin is actually a peptide hormone and um, it uh, increases the two major functions would be incre uh, increase of water reabsorption and increase in vasoconstriction causing increase in arterial blood pressure so these this is a summary of the functions performed by the vasopressin so now this is the regulation of antidiuretic hormone these are the factors that are going to stimulate the vasopressin uh, production hyperosmolarity which means a concentrated uh, environment with less water and more solute decreased atrial receptor firing and sympathetic stimulation and all these factors are going to increase the production of vasopressin uh, by the posterior pituitary so the effects of vasopressin is going to be the constriction of blood vessels which in turn is going to increase the resistance and increase the arterial pressure and the other effect would be the fluid reabsorption which is going to increase the blood volume and going to in, in turn increase the arterial blood pressure. These are the two types of receptors of vasopressin. V1 receptors are present in blood vessels and V2 receptors are present in kidneys. So this was the regulation of antidiuretic hormone. Okay, so the regulation of oxytocin, I think we missed that in the two slides earlier. We studied about uh, oxytocin. Now let us study about the regulation of oxytocin. Now what happens is that suckling and cervical stretch receptors, these are the two stimuli that are going to have a positive effect. Uh, they are going to stimulate the supraoptic and paraventricle ventricular nuclei to produce oxytocin from the posterior pituitary. So these two stimuli have a positive feedback, they have a positive effect on the production of oxytocin, which in turn is going to produce milk let down from mammary glands and contraction by the uterus. So these are the two functions performed by oxytocin. So this, these were the important functions of the two hormones produced by the posterior pituitary. So today we discussed the importance of the pituitary gland, why is it called as the master gland of the body and we studied about the hormones that the different lobes produce. We studied about the relation uh, hypo of hypothalamus and pituitary, how these two uh, structures coordinate with each other and we studied the regulation of these hormones. We studied the regulation of growth hormone, oxytocin and ADH and all these other hormones. Growth hormone uh, was studied in detail. Its functions were discussed and its abnormalities were discussed. And in the end, we studied about the hormones of the posterior pituitary gland, ADH and vasopressin. Thank you for watching scaria.com.